the future belongs to the curious. This is an act of discovery. Come and experience it with us in Arakat and discover your creative potential. This is your path. This is your journey. You decide how it's going to be. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Come and experience it with us in Arakad and discover your creative potential. Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Esther Plumer from the Arkin University of Creative Arts and Design. And today I have the pleasure of introducing independent artist and poet Tim Brennan. Tim is professor of art and head of the Department of Art and Performance at Manchester, uh, Manchester School of Art, Manchester Metropolitan University. He studied fine art at the Slade, Slade School of Fine Art under Stuart Brisley, Susan Hiller, and history at the Ruskin College Oxford under Raphael Samuel and Hilda Keane. In the 1990s and early 2000s, Tim worked as a live art co-coordinator co at Camera Work and was director at the Art House Multimedia Center in Dublin. He also worked as curator of talks and critical events at the Art Center Dublin. Among other projects, he's curated the Brian Eno solo show in Dublin and as well as a um, survey of British sculpture at the Henry Moore Foundation. Tim has taught in many of the UK art schools and since 1992, he has been instrumental in the higher, higher art education landscape, having developed and delivered the curriculum at Dartington College of Art and having established the MA curating programs at Goldsmith and Sunderland. More recently, he was the director of predoctoral studies at the College of Creative Arts at Massey University in New Zealand. And alongside his achievements, his many achievements in the academic sphere, as an independent and contemporary artist, um, Tim Brennan is best known for being the first artist to consistently apply the use of walking in urban, rural, and interior contexts. Tim's practice includes performance, writing and drawing, painting, sculpture, photography, sound, video, as well as digital works. His artistic concerns lie in the human condition and its relation to space, place, and being in time. His work has been exhibited internationally across five decades at significant venues, such as the 54th Venice Biennale, the Museum of Modern Art in Belgrade, Centre Regional de la Photographie in France, and Le Lieu in Canada as well as various institutions across the UK, such as the Institute of Contemporary Art, the British Museum, the Mass Observation Archive, Icon Birmingham, and the National Maritime Museum. His works can be found in the collections of the University of Aberdeen, the Centre Regional de la Photographique, One-to-One -one Projects Rome, as well as Vienna Art Week. And his archive um, resides at the Univer uh, University of Creative Arts in the UK. Today, Tim will introduce some of his current projects, as well as his concerns, and he'll be speaking about walking, running, writing, reading, and painting. In his talk, he will cover his approach to making art, not only as an individual, but also in collaboration with others. His presentation is titled, Alone and Together, an introduction to some of my work. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ezra, and thank you, Arakad. I'm I'm really honoured to be able to um, to be here today, and to everybody who is here, who I can't see, but I know you are here. So um, welcome. Um, I will just share my screen. I think I am sharing my screen. Mm. 
Nope. Tim, I think your screen is showing. Um, I think if you go on full screen on the PowerPoint, it should be okay. Okay, are we there? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. So, um, yes, so I've been uh, working and showing internationally since um, 1986. So I started exhibiting when I was an undergraduate student um, um, and I studied in the north of England and I was very interested in um, how I could start uh, working between the areas of sculpture and performance um, and without, without being involved in perhaps acting for the stage or working with a script. So very much interested in the idea of activity within a studio setting or within a site related setting. So a non-gallery, a non-art context. And um, as been mentioned in that, in that introduction, uh, my work um, falls across many approaches um, and forms, and it sometimes these are mixed together. Um, so sometimes people use the term interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. I tend not to think of um, art areas as disciplines. Um, I tend to think of them more as approaches. So as we can see here, performance, sculpture, video and digital work, photographs, uh, drawing, painting, uh, writing, poetry, curating artist books. So, you know, I could probably find some others to add to the list. Um, but really what I'm trying to indicate is that I have a kind of pan approach. And for a very long time, this was motivated by the sense that um, my art was formed from having uh, uh, questions uh, about the exterior world, or in fact, interior world, my own interior world, up to a point to begin with. But, but for the first half of my practice, um, I would say very much motivated by asking questions about the external context. Um, and so then the artwork, whatever the artwork would look like, whatever form or approach it would take, would very much be dependent upon the kinds of questions I was asking. So in terms of performance, it wasn't that I was necessarily going to make a performance next. It was a question of, do I want to work with something that's to do with behavior? Do I want to interact with social uh, situations with other people in a room? And so you can see then, while I'm asking those questions or exploring those questions, it becomes evident to me that what I'm going to use is a live situation and I'm going to figure in that situation. So a performance. So I'm going to see if this works. I think it is. So here's just a little brief uh, tour of a kind of tessellated uh, tour of work that I've made. This is my Instagram page, artist page. And, um, you know, I find it, I find it incredibly useful, especially now going through the COVID era to be able to make um, um, careful kinds of decisions as to what I'm going to post next. Sometimes they're from the deep past in terms of my deep past. Sometimes they're very, very current. So you can see the range of forms that, and approaches that I've got here. Sometimes they are advertisements from um, works that I've made. Sometimes they're documentation. You might call them documentation. So, yeah. And then I have now, where are we gone? 
Let's have a look. I think I've disappeared. Oh, no, I haven't. There you go. So then um, I've got a, um, a website, which I won't double click on right now. You can visit it when I, uh, um, we'll have it in the links. Okay, so um, I was very honored to be the first artist to exhibit in um, the Arakad art space um, in Nicosia in 2018, um, which was actually the last time I had an exhibition of two-dimensional and, um, and video uh, work. Um, there would have been more, but uh, the pandemic has meant that pretty much all of us have had to uh, modify our, our practices if we've been involved in, in making sculptures or, paint or paintings uh, or video work or two-dimensional work, or in fact, performance work. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was a fantastic opportunity and I, I, I wanted to try and give a kind of retrospect, a kind of a slant on an artist's retrospective or rather a, a survey. So it wasn't a comprehensive overview of everything that I'd done, but it, it was a, a survey uh, of, of some of the work um, that could fit into a smaller space, into a smaller uh, gallery uh, complex, uh, such as uh, the Arakad art space. So I was working with materials from, from, my, from my past, uh, so you can see here in the uh, in the center bottom, you know, you've got some image, an image, and also the center left. Uh, sorry, the the left on the bottom. Um, you have um, some images from performances that were made in the 80s and 90s, but you've also got some photographs that I've arrived at um, more recently. And with them, um, I so working with a sense of an archive that was developing or a resource of work that's been developing over a long period of time. Um, I, I was then writing um, short poems for each one. They're kind of like reflections or, or responses to each of those images. Um, and in the form of three lines, so a triad or a haiku. In fact, in fact, they did conform to to one of the uh, approaches to to arriving at a haiku. And then also, in the bottom right hand corner, a much longer text piece uh, that was from a found text. Um, Actually, the speech at the graveside of Karl Marx uh, uh, is the, the, you can't see it to read it here, but is, is the text in black, which Friedrich Engels wrote and gave. And then I added um, uh, text in red, which was a speech, uh, or rather a piece of text, but I called it a speech for the purposes of this, speech at the birth of the daughter, um, which is the birth of my daughter. Um, so, um, so you can get a sense that I work with text here. Um, I also work with video. This is a video in the top right hand corner of a, of a work that I made in um, New Zealand when I lived in New Zealand that actually uh, twinned um, a site in, in, in North New Zealand that bears a, a, that bears a real resemblance to the Dardanelles to the uh, Gallip site of Gallipoli in Turkey. And so this is very much about these twinned, twin sites where there, are, there is a memorial um, in, in, in New Zealand, as well as the memorial in, in, in the Dardanelles. So I was very interested, especially in 2018, in that anniversary, that commemoration of, um, of, 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 uh, the period of time between the 1914-18 war and, and 2018. Okay, here's just some images of performances that, are, that I've made uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. So very much working with the body at the center of, of the practice of the, of the, of the situation. So 
I might use this term body centered performance. It's actually the kind of mode of performance that uh, is is quite common, quite usual. So you can think of most performance artists that their body becomes the the object in time and space uh, um, that is received by perhaps we wouldn't call them an audience. Perhaps we might call them in these situations um, a witness. And in the top right hand corner, there's a work there where it's not clear as to where my body is. And I was beginning by the mid by the early 1990s to become dissatisfied in my body being being the center piece of the performance. And the reason for that is that I had been interested for a very long time in using performance to break down the, ba the barriers, the perceived barriers between a traditional performance audience or theater audience and the performer. Now, this wasn't a new idea. There had been experiments historically in this. There had been quite a lot of work in this. But, I, but, but for my own practice trajectory, I was very interested in how I might find my own way of breaking those, those, those barriers down so that I wouldn't be the focus of attention but that the situation at hand, which would be a social situation that I would set up and in a sense direct up to a point and then see what would happen um, from that point onwards, how that might uh, be formed or how it might be activated. Um, and I guess my, my motivation would be to um, try and, and and provide a situation or set up a situation where the authority of the the performer could be could be offered up so that the sense of authority in a space could become material in a space that could be taken up by others and something could be done with it so in the top right hand corner you have an ongoing performance but you can't see me in it uh, there's actually a dog in the middle of it. It's kind of interesting. This is in Holland where dogs are allowed into some gallery spaces. Um, uh, but what I've done is I've asked uh, the, the, the viewer, the visitor to have invited them to do certain things like paint a word on the wall or, um, or pull, a, pull a rope so that a burning chair would become hoisted in the, in, in the air or choose a chair to sit on and, and arrange it in any fashion they want. So, and, and then I might read a speech uh, or, or some kind of found political text out loud, or I might even uh, pass that around in multiple form and ask the, the viewer, the, the visitor, who's no longer a viewer, only a viewer, no longer only an audience, to, to read it out on mass like a choir um and then a discussion would in, ensue that that really would just happen automatically without my direction so i was beginning to move away from this sense of a purely body centered piece of work uh, that would be a performance in the first instance and then become a kind of iconic photograph like the one of center uh, um, uh, beyond that i wanted to try and break away from the object-centered artwork. <clears throat> this is a, a drawing that I did of a, perhaps of a skeleton, it is, um, on a cliff face in the northeast uh, of England or the, or the east of England on a, on a cliff face looking out to sea. So leaving a trace, just leaving a trace element of an activity um so now i'm going to talk about two aspect aspects of my of my work to date okay so the first is around my contribution to walking and running so as ezra said in the introduction i'm best known probably um for my contribution to to using walking as a vehicle uh, to uh, it, within within the art world as a vehicle for arriving at an artwork. So the walk is the work, 
but what the walk presents is is more important so in a sense you could argue that the that the that the walk is only a vehicle to arrive at uh what i'm asking individuals to start to think about on the walk so these walks take the form generally of of a guided walk and most of us have been on what i would term a conventional guided walk whether it's a uh, uh, a leisure walk whilst being a tourist with a tour guide or some other kind of historical or heritage based walk they all tend to have the same format to them uh, which is not to say they're all in the same place they're not they're spread out over the world in different ways they have different lengths of time to them but essentially what i'm trying to drive at here is that the guide will take you on a walk and they will show you things along the way and they will add a kind of definition or a description or some kind of un understanding that is generally agreed to be true about the places that you're stopping in and the things that you're looking at so we could call this a kind of literal approach to understanding uh, uh, sites along a route or understanding place and they're very powerful and they're very good uh, and so what am i saying by that i'm saying i'm not i'm not against them at all in fact i use some of their ingredients on my walks but what i but what i do do on my walks is that rather than speak from my own uh um perspective so rather than um in part share my my own views or my own direct travel writing about a place along the way i bring quotations to and read the quotations to the participants on the walk and these quotations can be from anywhere but they can't be anything so by that um i have a sense of a kind of constellation of ideas of where i might of of what i might want to uh read aloud or present along the way and um, and they might so there might be a number of themes that are running at the same time whilst i'm delivering a walk um, and the motivation is to provoke thinking, provoke a debate, a question, set of questions for the walkers who are with me. Um, and there's usually about 12 or maybe maximum about 25 along the way. Um, so, for instance, here at the Venice Biennale, um, um, the the central photograph here um, we're looking at the campanile in 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 st mark's square and here is here is my guide holding up the image of of the campanile um, and and on the back there's a there's a quote the image is by canaletta who's very famous um uh, uh historical painter of venice and um when you look at a canaletto you might think that the images the the depictions of venice are very very real in that you could use them to locate yourself very precisely or locate buildings very precisely the reality is that canaletto it was almost there but he he was very interested in making a good image so he he might move things around or he might add buildings if he needed to so that's very interesting so on the back of this uh, representation of a drawing of the campanile and it's a drawing of the campanile or an etching rather I beg your pardon an etching of the campanile uh, by Canaletto, and the Campanile is being 
um, um, rebuilt um, after after an earthquake in Venice. Um, and on the back of this card uh, is a quotation, um, and it's by Marinetti. And Marinetti, the um, futurist, 20th century futurist, uh, was heavily influenced and involved in in the in the very new um, ideology of of fascism, which had, in a sense, had had its source in in that early twentieth century Italian thinking. And Marinetti, who wrote the Futurist Manifesto, he he also um, he launched the manifesto, and he launched it from the top of the campanile so he threw out uh, 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 of the of the windows at the top of the campanile he threw out all of the pamphlets which were the futurist manifestos so that they fluttered down onto the ground and um, the quotation on the back of here is from there and it's very much to do with marinetti calling for the end of the of the sense of history and a new beginning and we're gonna we're gonna fill in the stinking canals of here and we're gonna flatten all of the all of the surroundings and we're gonna build a new kind of empire here that's gonna be modern and futuristic and now my use of this quote does not mean that um i'm pro marinetti or pro his sentiments what i'm trying to do is to set up uh, 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 a collision of what you can see and something from the past that is very much at odds with what another kind of tour guide might uh, use to describe this location. And so that over time, over time through this walk, you start to, to consider different perspectives and, and different points of view about a place, about what a place is, uh, about a journey and the sights along the way in the journey. So this way of working with the walking um, enables me to um, not be the centre of the work physically, bodily. Uh, it, it involves me asking people to to stop, look at something. Um, uh, whilst I read something to them, and sometimes I invite them to read it as well, but more often than not, it's me, it's me reading the quotations. And as I say, the quotations can be from anywhere. So you don't have to be a historical text. They could be from a novel. They could be from a newspaper. They could be recent. They could be very old. Um, they could be from an interview that I've made with somebody. Um, and then from the, from the walk, Sometimes before the walk, if it's a commission of a particular kind, uh, but, and often after the walk, um, I will put together uh, the materials and create a new work uh, that is a guidebook, a guidebook that you can use um, um, to either visit that place like you would with a, with a, you know, a conventional guidebook and to stop along the way and to read the quotations um, or you might with other with with conventional guidebooks you might never um, um, visit that place uh, you might be in Australia and enjoy reading guidebooks about Venice uh, but you might never visit Venice or if you do visit Venice you might forget to take your guidebook so you know these this is now a mode of travel writing um, that that takes on a new artistic form so the so the walk the performance of the walk which i call discursive performances because they're not body centered performances they're discursive they range around across different across different discourses across different areas of thinking um, the performance of the walk and what would normally be seen or understood to be the documentation of the walk is no longer documentation it becomes a new work that is a guidebook, so it becomes an artist book. Uh, I still make these walks, um, but I've also added another dimension to my work, which is running. Um, I became so involved in the an inquiry into place 
um, and the doing of history, the, the doing of experience in time in relation to environments through the walking, that I started to wonder whether or not um, the same kinds of th thoughts and ideas and reflections uh, would emerge if I was running. So I took up running in my mid 40s. I had to teach myself. I never liked running. I wanted to just see what would happen. And what I discovered was that um, when you're running long distances, it's a very different experience to walking for an hour around a city at a leisurely place and reading quotations to yourself. You haven't really got time. You haven't got the time to consider the places that you're passing through in the same way. So I, just, I, I really found that the running became, um, became a kind of inquiry into space and time as opposed to the walking being an inquiry into place and time. And these, these runs would get longer and longer. So I ran across uh, England from west to east, and I ran across uh, England in a day, across, a ro across the Roman wall, the, the remains of the Roman wall. Is 74 miles, UK miles. And there'd been a big rainstorm uh, the night before. So it actually ended up being, you know, 85 miles. So over 100 kilometers in a day. Um, and from that, from that run, I wrote a poem. It was actually a very long poem, and I've never, I've never published it or performed it. Um, it was a kind of epic poem and the epic nature of it was to reflect the epic run. And then I started to run other distances that were connected to the idea of boundaries, especially the boundary, the, the frontier of the ancient Roman Empire. Um, uh, so I ran across Scotland in a day and then I ran across Holland in a day. Uh, from the east coast, so, sorry, from the west coast to, to the German border. And um, since then, I've, I've modified that work um, to take more control over, over the distance and where the distance would be. So I took the idea of the, of, of the great eye, the great eye, which is a storm, and it's known as the red eye of Jupiter, the planet, which fluctuates in size, but it's a very old storm. It's been going for over 200 years. It fluctuates in size, but when I started uh, a run, and I'll explain in a second what that run was, or is, in fact, that the diameter of the great eye storm um, was 16,000 kilometers. So I decided that I would break down that distance into my daily life's running. Small runs could be of different sizes. It could be five kilometers, it could be two kilometers, it could be 10, it could be 20, depending on where I was in my life. I say daily, not every day, it's not good for me. Uh, every other day is better. Um, and then from each run uh, or from clusters of those runs, I would write a haiku. So you have a kind of, and in the bottom right hand corner here is a, is a haiku. And the haiku are emerging very much as, as as reflections on space and time, as opposed to place and time, like the walks. Um, and the sense is to find other ways of, of considering for myself, of considering being in time that are not bound by our physical environments. So, um, and, and I started this project, um, which is called Red Eye Runner, 
I started this project a, a few years before COVID, uh, and it's and it's been continuing during COVID. And indeed, it it made up some of the um, postcards in the in the exhibition in New Space. But it's ongoing, and I think I'm on um, slightly less now than the thirteen thousand kilometers or nearly fourteen thousand. You can see there in the bottom right hand corner. So it's got a long way to go. So it's a life work as opposed to a day's work. Okay, I'm going to show this, I think, yeah, very 30 second um, um, video of, of the Museum of Angels. This was a, a, a guidebook and a set of tours that I made in 2003 to commemorate to um, uh, mark the anniversary, 250th anniversary of the British Museum, which would argue that it's the first museum ever in the world. So I'd say it would argue that. Um, and I looked at the all of the angels, or I found, in fact, all of the angels that were on display at the time, and I made a directory of them. But I also made this um, guidebook that's made up of quotations that in some way get you to think about uh, uh, the idea of winged intermediary creatures uh, between... Uh, were between dimensions so whether they're good angels uh bad angels or angels that are bored and are indifferent so the museum of angels i'll just uh show this So here's myself in the British Museum. It's the only image of, of 10 of these walks that I made with this guidebook. It's the only image of me. It's a very small thumbnail that exists in the world. It's from a journal uh, of a review of, of my walk. And uh, here I am, um, slightly bleached out. I don't know whether it's an angelic bleaching or not, but slightly bleached out by the light. Uh, and there's an angel behind me. And this is a self-portrait of um, of myself, and uh, this this tattoo on my back is of a <clears throat> is of a symbol that's called the Monad Hieroglyphica or the Monas Hieroglyphica, and it was put together by a, a 16th century astrologer. Uh, he was also a, a pre-scientist, a pre uh, and an artist, uh, 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 in a sense, a natural philosopher um, called John Dee, less of an artist, but he was very much an English uh, Renaissance figure. And he was Queen Elizabeth I's uh, astrologer, but he also wrote um, a key navigational text for seafarers. And he um, he devised this this hieroglyphica and this symbol is can be taken apart and put a, put together again in various different kinds of formations and um, has a bearing on different astrological symbols uh, um, so yes so in total the idea of a monad is the idea of a single unit that absorbs everything that we know um, and I thought in relation, and it figured, it figured in the uh, Museum of Angels. Um, and so I thought it, it would be something that if I was going to have a tattoo, um, that would be the tattoo. Um, and there it is. So that's a self-portrait. So my face is less important in a sense. It, in a sense, it could be any human. Uh, but it is important that it's me, but it could be any human or anything perhaps.
Okay, so in the last uh, few minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the work that I'm making right now. Um, in a, the, is in addition to the running and thinking about my next walk, um, which are three collaborations. This myself and Electra Mica, Mipa. And Electra, this is Electra on the right. Uh, she is uh, uh, from Northwest um, Macedonia. And um, she works in a range of different ways from performance to um, to sculpture to video um, it, you might even she might even call herself a virtual artist um, and we've been working together with combinations of it's supposed to be blank so don't worry combinations of um, uh, text poetry uh, and ways of presenting text and poetry in digital formations. So this is a new work and it's a work in progress. So there is a few stills from this work. We're developing a, um, a website. And when you go to the website, if you're the user and you drag your cursor across this blank screen, you might affect a drawing, like for instance, this one in the top left hand corner. And as you pull your cursor in any fashion across the screen, not only are you creating a drawing, but you start to reveal words along the way. So here we have the word orbs. And as you touch the word orbs, it reveals itself and also it reveals a web link to information on the web. And then you do some more, and then you find there is orbs and a cross and Euclid. So there's more information. And you can see that the information is, uh, is, 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 you know, diverse. It kind of reflects the diversity of the web and the diversity of words. And here we have more. So we build a poem, we build, you build a drawing, you also build a poem that we've prepared, or you reveal a poem that we've prepared, but then you kind of build a poem because you can read it in a number of directions, in a number of, you can rearrange it as you move across it, and, you all, and we also reveal uh, uh, a set of informational uh, um, moments well not yeah multiple moments and it might trigger dynamics it might trigger spaces in between to consider so we would like to engage you in this uh, aragad uh, later in in the year or over time um, and and develop a workshop around this with the students um, and that's a proposal that we make to you uh, to see you know how your how how you as students at Aracad might uh, interface with this as users, and we might develop a conversation around this. So that's one project, and that's Electra's uh, uh, personal website. If you want to go and look at it, and then the next one is called Fascicles Project with Heather Young, and Heather Young is a poet based in uh, Dundee in Scotland. She's from Orkney, which is an island off the, the very northern coast of, uh, of Scotland. Um, and um, yeah, so this is, a, it is an example of her work here, just one example. So she's a literary uh, critic and writer, and this is her latest work on Kafka and ecology voice and, the object, and object life. And this is one of her poems in the middle, and this is Heather here. Looks like she's looking at them. And then this is some work that we've been making together. This is fascicles. Uh, a fascicle is a, is, a, is a kind of element, if you like, an element of a book. Um, and we're very interested in spineless books, books that, uh, you know, are not heavily bound together. Um, and we're interested in, in, in books that are handmade and books that don't have an ISBN with them. 
um, and many artists' books are non-ISBN books. So this fascicle unfolds like this. I'll give you a sense of scale, that postcard, so that it's small. You open out and it's got tracing, tracing, a kind of tracing paper there with the text on it so it overlays over the image. So we, we de we've developed quite a few of these now and we haven't exhibited them yet, um, but we aim to and we will be. And this is a web page that carries some more of Heather's work, scottishpoetrylibrary.org. And then lastly, just to round off, um, this is myself and Dean Brannigan in uh, 1992. And here we are. And this title of this work is called Common Body. Um, and we are sharing one set of clothes. Uh, there are actually about 36 images that break down the sharing of the clothes. But I thought I would put this in to show you, uh, really, we've been working together since uh, since before that time. So it's a very long time. And we're still working together. And here's Dean now. So he looks rather different, right? Okay. This is from a DJ, uh, from the publicity to a DJ set that he did at the Barbican Centre in uh, in London uh, last year. And this project that we're involved in at present is called Psychic Painting. And um, every Friday at 9 p.m., uh, Dean lives in London and I live in Manchester. And at 9 p.m. every Friday, Dean makes a painting for 20 minutes and I make a painting for 20 minutes. Uh, we don't talk to each other beforehand. We know we're going to do it. And then we share the images. The motivation is to see uh, along the way what kinds of synergies they are, how they talk to each other. The duration is always 20 minutes. We text each other just before and we say, ready, start, stop, and then we share the images. And then sometimes we go, oh my goodness. And sometimes we go, that's interesting. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to develop this project um, for, for, for an event with the students at Arakad later in the year. We would like to um, have a mass, a mass um, psychic painting event, 20 minutes uh, long. Um, and I think you know how we would do it. We don't have to be in the same place. And uh, the materials would be very simple for each person to get together. And then we can find ways of sharing that across, across our, our distances and perhaps exhibiting them. And this is Dean's um, uh, one of his websites and i've put the instagram page for psychic painting further up in this in this presentation and these are a whole set of links that you can go to to have a look at my work so i've got my instagram page i've got the tim brennan artist page there and then a whole range of facebook pages that that platform my work so stop sharing here we are I'm very Thank much... you very much. Oh, you could see. It. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. No, 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 that's fine. So I hope that's given you a kind of idea of, of the range of work uh, that I've been involved in. Um, I think one thing is that when you've been involved in making work of a public nature for so long, uh, when you're asked to uh, kind of give an overview, well, you didn't ask me to give an overview, but it seemed important to give an introduction. 
And uh, you have to be very selective and careful. And I've tried to balance the two things there to, between a kind of broad range and a bit of depth into some of the projects and ideas that are really current for me. Absolutely. And there, thank you very much for that. I think there are some clear threads that um, continue throughout your work um, across these decades. And there, we do have a couple of questions from our listeners, but I, I will take the liberty of asking Brilliant. my own first, if that's okay. Um, I, I wanted to start off with uh, some, some of the things that stood out to me, especially in your collaborations and how those relate to your individual work. Um, it, I, I was really interested to see your collaboration with Electra as well as with Dean and how there is um, an element of chance in, in both of those. And I, I, wanted to dis I wanted to ask you to discuss uh, the element of chance in relation to the element of control um, in these projects. So with, with Electra, uh, with the project that you develop with Electra, a chance when the participant is using the cursor to create these almost automatic um, drawings or sketches yeah. with the mouse on the screen. And it's fascinating to see how those points of contact uh, kind of make some some information or some text or poems or things to pop up. So for my first question is, um, are, is information, uh, you know, related to the, mo the movement of the cursor and the different movement? So wherever the cursor goes, it, it you know, correlates to a different point uh, in the software that gives us a different result, doesn't it? It does. So there's a lot in that in that question. So I yeah. think in, in no, it's good. It's a great question, uh, Ezra. Mm -hmm. The the chance is really important for me in 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 the production of an artwork, and and also because of my work in performance and the particular approach to performance, where I might set up a situation and activate a situation that's live, but then not know in advance what's gonna happen because I've activated a live situation with others. I think I've always been interested in that chance element of, I don't know what's gonna happen. You know, mm -hmm. a bird might fly down and do something <laughs> which it has done before in walks or, uh, or, or something might happen lots of things have happened in the walks that you have to mm. respond to because they are to do with the dynamics of everyday life which actually can be incredibly dramatic when you when you framed a situation as a performance i know i'm using the term situation a lot it's not necessarily the same as situationism i'm using it as a shorthand today uh, mm. to, to get somewhere that's that's slightly deeper than 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 trying to find kind of event or performance or whatever. But sit, these are our kind of situations that are open to chance. Things can happen inside yeah. and that are not predetermined. And so I think finding ways for me of working with someone else uh, to to hold and preserve a sense of chance in there. Uh, whilst opening it out to others uh, uh, in a in a in a kind of controlled fashion, enables the work to be harnessed as a, as a discrete work. So it holds itself as as an as an object of art. It's still an object of art, um, but within it, it has this world that is very much uh, akin similar to our world in the everyday life of we don't quite know what's going to happen but we have routines we have an object mm -hmm. for the day so that that's important why it's important is a really good would be a really good question as well um mm -hmm. i think it stems for me it stems a long way back to feeling when i was very young um starting out into a kind of trajectory of being an artist, maybe 19, 18, um, feeling dissatisfied and disgruntled and angry about 
objects in art galleries and and paintings on the wall and and feeling very uh, um, uh, not aggressive but assertive about the need to break it down and to have a direct relationship with people well actually i i i'm i i'm heavily committed to art in its traditional forms and its multiple forms and its decolonized forms and and so you know i've i've kind of matured or changed but i've carried with me a sense of can there be a sense uh, can there be uh, a way of of bridging of bridging that gap between what we might term everyday life and and the more sealed world of the art, of the art of the artwork Mm, and I'm sure a lot of our um, students and listeners can relate to those feelings, um, especially in, in their practices and the way that they think about and approach um, art making as well. And I wonder if we can expand a little bit, if we have the time on what you're, what you're talking about, these external elements of the everyday and, and, and the situation in our surroundings. I think it really relates closely to what you've um, also discussed in relation to the internal about the subject and the way that you see, especially in your performance pieces, the way that you take the body and um, your experimentation with, in a way of removing or handing over the authority of the body or the voice over to the, um, the, the place or the space as material or to other writers or excerpts using those elements. I wonder if there is a, um, any element of chance in that in relation to automatism. And also maybe if you can um, take that thread and walk it, walk it to your more recent work in relation to these psychic paintings, which to me, of course, um, uh, my interest in surrealism automatically, uh, you know, raises my uh, memory and, and it reminds me of the automatic exquisite corpse drawings that the surrealists used to exchange um, between themselves and among among one another. So I wonder if you can comment on that, and we'll we'll move on to um, the other questions that we have as well. Well, I can certainly start talking in response to it. It's, it's brilliant. Sure. It's another rich question, and inside it, there are so many multiple dimensions. Um, If I look at it one way in a, in a perhaps a more simplified way for myself, that, that there has been very much a kind of external engagement and then and then a, and then a shining a light, if you like, on what has always been there, but has perhaps been kept from the public nature of the work and in an internal engagement and with psychic painting. You have my pro the project with Dean. You have an instance where we have something that is very kind of controlled, but we're 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 displaced over you know quite a long distance. You know, it's a few hours on the train, so we're not we're not together. And also, pandemic means that you're not doing it in the same room for different reasons. Um, that that you that and yet. So it's, it, it is a shared experience, but there are, and you could use the term, but it, it could get politicized easily, a very privatized, um, um, which I don't really want it to be politicized in, in immediately, um, a privatized aspect to it that's very important. So my focus on, on the piece of paper for 20 minutes is really important mm -hmm. and and his focus on his piece of paper might be very important and then the sharing of those gives a slightly opened out dimension to it i'm moving chairs around as well in some performances by the way and then uh I can hear something and then um and then we find a way of 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 making it on one level very public with the use of Instagram and yet actually very private because there's a, there's a very much a control with big tech platforms there's very much a, a kind of sense of 
you witness or you engage in some in something in the palm of your hand on a, on a phone you're not necessarily showing it to somebody else you might share it you might it's less easy to share it on instagram in a particular way for, for the user for the recipient for the viewer so how this relates to uh, the exquisite corpse uh, is is probably a longer discussion it's certainly it certainly has a relationship to it we haven't we haven't we're not setting out to to explicitly relate to it uh, and the project of surrealism um we are very much interested in 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 a sense of a shared consciousness mm -hmm. um but at the same time we we don't want to um broadcast that for want of a better term in a very loud way um i'm very open to there being a number of truths that i might not be able to grasp mm. um and that is a thread that's gone through my work but there have been different different dimensions to how it is how it is revealed or how it emerges and I think in a way that common body piece where we exchange a piece of clothes between each other yeah. um, is very much related to psychic painting. And this is something that Dean said to me the other day. He said, it's like common body. And, and I said, oh, yeah, actually, it mm. is the same inquiry, but on another level of how can we share uh, uh, something? Whereas in common body in 1992, we were saying, look, things are shared between people that are common yeah which is one way of saying something what we're doing now is saying let's explore that let's explore what we what what we're doing at the same time and they're very different paintings and yet they they have a conversation with they live together those exactly. paintings. absolutely and on that note i actually want to integrate a question that we had early on in in your um talk by ahmed shimshek who asked how one can be made uh, how can how one can be more brave and avoid self censorship when it comes to writing i think when when you're discussing that uh, shared consciousness and about expression uh the the idea of censorship is quite relevant so thank you very much to ahmed for uh, asking that question i think that's a great question ahmed um and i think for myself it's only more recently over the last few years that I've become to allow myself to to make to make things, whether it's writing or a painting, that perhaps formerly before I would have perhaps um, tempted. I wouldn't have let myself do them because they weren't stylistically the right thing for me to do. Even though I would have never thought about style, I would have been against myself having a style. But really, in reality, I would have had a set of limitations that I'd say, well, I'm going to let that in and I'm not going to let that one in because it doesn't it doesn't look right in terms of how I make work or how I want it to look. And there was something important about that because it meant that I was using my judgment and having a control over my my practice, that I wasn't just doing anything uh, or, or, or not thinking and not thinking about it. It wasn't a case of like, well, it could be anything you know but now i find that being opening that and not being and not being not limiting myself and but finding mechanisms that are, or 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 procedures to produce the work is is that are actually very controlled um for example we start at nine o'clock we paint for 20 minutes um we we perhaps can't paint huge frescoes because we're in a COVID situation, so they are pretty kind of desktop or, or smaller. And then we share what we've got. Is a procedure, is a set of um, terms, the set of rules that we have. Um, but within that, it doesn't it doesn't it does matter, but it doesn't matter on another level as to what comes out because what comes out is the important thing not not that it should be of a certain type of thing that comes out 
So I think I think you're absolutely right in 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 saying that there is a censorship. If that's what you're saying, there's a self censorship. And for me, trying to find procedures that release it, but the procedures are, are kind of tight enough to give a sense of um, continuity to whatever the project is, is is what I think is the way in which I approach it. Yeah, and, and just uh, moving on from that note, actually, it relates to another question that we have from SR Kechiji, uh, thinking about the audience, the receiver, um, the external audience, uh, apart from the collaborator. Uh, SR says, very impressive. How do you evaluate the effect, the effect of social media, such as Instagram that you're using, on the way your artwork is being received by the audience? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question about evaluation. And um, on one level, which is pretty much a core level, I could say, and it's a very traditional uh, approach, uh, of, uh, principle, I think, of an, art, of an artist, very traditional, uh, in terms of a Western tradition mind. Uh, that I'm quite selfish around um, not necessarily being overly concerned about what people think about what I've made. Now, what's interesting is that with social media, um, there seems to me, and I don't think I'm the first person to have said it, I'm not, that there's this governance of, of quality that might be a false governance, of course, around thumbs up, ticks, likes, heart signs, how many likes you get. And it's interesting um, as to how that has developed in our societies or in our society. I'm not overly concerned about how to evaluate. The evaluation is, is not built in like you might find in artists who describe themselves as socially engaged practitioners it's the kind of term that's used which i don't i don't use that to to describe my practice it does involve it has involved social engagement but it's not that sort of art titling of socially engaged practice so it, the evaluation of what people think or the value that they've extracted from the engage from their from their being in the work or receiving the work, witnessing the work, is is not overly important to me. But I'm a human, and you know, if I get 150 likes, that would be a lot of likes. You know, uh, you know, it would feel good for for a bit. But I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that 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 I do or don't value the thing that I've made. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of being a driving um, factor, I, I, I guess what you're saying is it, it's not basically, but um, I am basically. It, the, yeah, I mean, the, the way that um, social media or technology alike uh, allows us to have a platform or uh, allows artists like you who have a pan approach to making works, um, you know, it allows us different platforms to engage with um, your types of works and your collaborative projects as well for us to, um, in a way, uh, uh, bear witness to them and, and engage with them as well. And I think um, the way that our perception of people's thoughts or the way that social transformation takes place in, in relation to, for example, um, what what is chosen to um, you know be excerpt from deep history, like like you said in the beginning of your um, talk, uh, or from your deep history, or from history overall, or the text that you engage with in your tours and talks and on your runs. I think they're very interesting, and uh, I wonder if your choices in the subjects that you engage with. Uh, are somehow connected to um, the times that we live in in relation to, for example, uh, you know, social transformation in terms of Black Lives Matter or uh, the women's uh, queer movements that is, you know, 
more visible in our current day with COVID, uh, everything. Um, how how do you engage with uh, those, basically? I engage with them as a, as a human in when I'm when I'm not necessarily obviously making a work of art in everyday life. I engage with them. I navigate with them. I have affiliations and I uh, or not. And you know, I that I engage with them that way. I tend to um, have. I tend to, and this gets gets back to the censorship uh, question. Mm -hmm. I tend to pull away from. Uh, making art that has a very explicit affiliation to it. Now, I would have thought, looking at my myself, looking at my work over time, that I think there's been a shift from it being quite pronounced in terms of its kind of ideological positioning um, for many years to a stepping aside from that it doesn't mean that it gets rid of it but a stepping aside from it in the in the production of the work in order to actually allow it to breathe in a sense uh, or to let in or, or to let in or, or how to harness i think when i started to make the walks i discovered a way of, of of the walking became the guided walking became a, a means by which multiple different perspectives could be presented and laid out that were the voices of different different texts by different people at different points in history and time and that they would be read aloud by me like a ventriloquist for multiple positions and that would enable it to be different, a, a mixture of audience who might have diverse positions. Now, that's not to say that outside of that work, I wouldn't vote for X or affiliate with that, this over here. But in the work, I want, I want as broad an engagement, their engagement as possible. And so it's important for me to, to make that distinction that that is, I feel, that is a political element to the work, but it's not a political element that is, uh, or, or it's a politicised approach to making the work, but it's not, it's not um, explicitly affiliating itself to uh, a one particular, particular ideology or one particular concern in the world, which, which might be very important. They're very important, if not critical, but for me the job of my work is to approach things in a way that enables this as diverse an engagement as possible so it absolutely does, yeah sorry it doesn't have to be only for those that know about art and i have a lot of people that come on the walks that are that are non-artists and it's very important for me to be able to present a work that can work if you like, in a, in a way for those who really are fully immersed in the history of art, or fully immersed in a particular history of art or a concern, and also those that have, that have got nothing to do or seemingly nothing to do with art in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And, and what you're saying about um, giving, allowing that space for uh, multiple perspectives to have um, a voice through you in those spaces with different participants is is very um, significant, especially in a way that it's it's not didactic in in the sense that you're not explicitly saying or uh, expressing a certain opinion. But of course, there is still an element of choice in your choosing of certain yeah. texts and and the way that we engage with certain texts or authors or uh, thinkers at certain times in history is also a, a, a stand or an, exp an expression in itself. But it uh, by not explicitly stating what uh, your uh, understanding of that person's um, writing or why you're choosing that, you are actually 
allowing the text to um, have its own life with its receiver, which yeah. is um, quite quite an important thing. And when you said, you know, um, like a ventriloquist, the author or the the text is kind of uh, living through me in a, in a sense. And you're not putting the person who writes it even um, as primary. You're the text because it itself becomes um, the primary uh, medium. Um, I think so it's a little bit like sorry. Yeah. It's a little bit like the idea of channeling. Mm. You know, the idea of channeling uh, from the spirit world. You know, uh, just just the idea of it. I'm not saying there's a truth to it or not but that you see i'm doing it again right but the idea of channeling <laughs> so the idea of being a ventriloquist the better the ventriloquist the more you don't see the 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 artifice now you do see the artifice very much so when i'm reading it out i've got the text and i read it out but the voice that is the same voice and it's consistent which is my voice but the voices are very different Mm. And, and, you know, um, very interestingly, it, it kind of echoes your approach to walking or running or other, other mediums as a vehicle in, in a way, um, yeah. uh, speaking, speaking itself becomes another vehicle uh, along with the others in, yeah. in our journey to, to art, as you say. And I, I wanted to share another question, which I think could actually read as an invitation as well by um, again, Esar Kechiji, who says, considering our experiences under pandemic, under the pandemic, we adjust almost all social activities online. What do you think of the possibility of making your walking works online with participants from Cyprus, a kind of synchronized tour? So I think that could be understood as an invitation um, for you to come or, or for you to uh, collaborate with Cyprus. It's fantastic. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> we have. I have two proposals, and I've agreed to one proposal. So, so far, I'm proposing that we have a mass synchronized uh, uh, psychic painting event. Fantastic! So it's only twenty minutes long, right? It, on one level, you know, you've got to get your stuff together, but you can do that without there being any problem at all. You don't have to do it in the same room. In fact, it's better if you do it in different rooms. I think. Why is that? There's different conversation. Um, and then there is the, you know, I, I'm going to invite you to, and it's not ready yet. It's a work in progress that oh, it hasn't got a title yet. The work that I'm making with the lecture, the, the, the poem, the drawing, mm. uh, um, the information, that work. Um, we'd like you to possibly be the first users or to use it all together and for us to do a, a discussion around it. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, this is synchronized walk. Let's do a synchronized walk. Now, there have been lots of versions of synchronized walks that are online um, uh, during the pandemic. I haven't been involved. I haven't produced one as yet. And it might be interesting to produce one, you know, in the forthcoming period when, you know, hopefully we're all kind of moving to the next stage of the COVID era, as I call it, where, where there are, we're being released at least for periods of time. So it, it's good because it's not in the first instance of, of COVID hitting us that we say, let's do a synchronized walk online. It's good to actually do it now, I think. So yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. Once, once we've kind of things, we can now focus on the more productive elements. I think so, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. All right. If... I think that's all the questions that we have. And if, if you want to make a um, or an uh, ending statement or anything, uh, we can, we can end on that. Yeah, I haven't prepared one, but it's a bit like my opening statement, which is, um, you know, I'm really, really grateful and I'm, I'm really deeply honored to be to be uh, able to be a visiting professor at Arakad and to also to be able to share today um, with you um, an introduction to my work and and for the to to receive these fantastic questions you know really sophisticated engagement uh, sounds a bit patronizing i didn't mean it to be like that but they are really multi-layered uh questions from from 
from the students who unfortunately I can't see you. But that's not that's not a criticism of today's uh, setup. It's unfortunately it'd be great to be able to make eye contact with you and say, oh hello, and um, and you to look at me and go, he's got a lot of wrinkles, hasn't he? You know <laughs> that kind of thing. So you know it's it's really great, and also from yourself, Ezra, for 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 not only chairing the 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 event. But, all, but also for for these really insightful questions as well, which have have really made me think a lot uh, in a good way, and that's always a good thing to do. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Arakad, and thank you every everybody who's here today. And there may be people who are here today who are not at Arakad who've got hold of the link which is fantastic it might be some manchester people but there might also be some other people around as well so um thanks everybody it's, it's thank you very much tim it's been a pleasure having you and hearing about your work is, is has been very inspiring for me and as well as to all our listeners i'm sure um we we really hope that you'll come visit us soon and we'll we'll be um face to face in person very very I've, soon I've had, my, I've had my two uh Oxford uh, AC uh, jabs, which means that it, it, with my passport, if if I'm allowed, uh, if if planes are allowed more and more, then uh, at least I'll be allowed. So um, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, it's it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us today, and keep um, keep wa watching our, our space and keep uh, you know engaging with us and please have a look at all of the links shared by Tim. Uh, we look forward to seeing your participation in, in his projects. And thank you very much everyone. And we are you know we're really looking forward to you all coming or receiving you uh, at Manchester School of Art and yes. uh, let, uh, you know I almost forgot, didn't I? Um, you know, <laughs> We have a we have a broader uh, uh, agreement, and and you know that's very very important, and uh, and we really are looking forward to that point in time. Whenever it's going to happen, it'll happen, and it'll be good. So thank you. Yes, watch the space, everyone. See you soon. Take bye care. Bye. Do you remember how you discovered the world around you? Can you hear the beat of life? Can you hear it by seeing it and feeling with all your senses? Hey, can you still hear it? There's something in you, driving you, calling you. Calling you in closer and closer. It's happening right now. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Now, it's time to act. This is an act of discovery. It requires looking to the world in new ways. not offering you the answers. We are here to encourage your questions, but more important than the question is how you answer it.
Try the ordinary, then try the unusual. To live is learn, and to learn is to live. Live, learn. It's an endless process. This is your path. This is your journey. You decide how it's going to be. Just enjoy every moment of it. We believe in design, keeping it simple but also significant. We believe in art for looking at the world with a unique perspective. We believe in creativity for communicating better with the world. Creativity takes courage. The future belongs to the curious. Come and experience it with us in Arakat and discover your creative potential.